Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Haken. I'm a professor of church history at uh, Heritage College and Seminary. And welcome to this uh, ongoing online lecture series that we've been having during this uh, pandemic. My uh, area of uh, focus and specialty is uh, church history, so not surprisingly, uh, my lecture today uh, is dealing with uh, a figure in church history, a very well known figure, probably the one of the most influential figures uh, in the history of the Western Church uh, and Western churches after the Reformation, and uh, that is Augustine. Uh, the title of the lecture uh, is Oh Beauty, So Ancient and New, God, Beauty and Sex uh, in Augustine. And really what I want to do in this lecture is kind of trace uh, his life up until uh, the time of his conversion. There's obviously a lot more that can be said about Augustine. I uh, teach a course on Augustine, so we do about 36 hours uh, on his thought, and um, uh, to kind of compress that into a very small frame, as we're doing in this lecture, uh, is challenging, and uh, all of you who are listening uh, live, and then will listen later to the uh, lecture, uh, need to understand that there is a lot, lot more that could be said about this remarkable figure. I really want to focus on the way in which God brought him to Christ. Uh, he was born in 354. He would come to faith in Christ, uh, living faith in Christ in 386. And so that kind of early time frame of 32 years is going to occupy us over the next uh, 35 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, please note at the end of our time, uh, there'll be a Q&A. Uh, questions can be uh, uh, sent in. And uh, then uh, at the end of our time, to uh, the formal lecture, uh, we'll look at uh, those questions. In his famous work, which is simply entitled uh, Confessions, which Augustine wrote probably around the year 399-400, Augustine <clears throat> says this in answer to the age-old philosophical question, what is beauty? I was late in loving you, oh beauty, so ancient and new, so new. I was late in loving you. Behold, you were inside me, but I was outside. And there I looked for you, deformed as I was, immersing myself among the beautiful forms you had made. You were with me, but I was not with you. These forms kept me far from you, forms that do not exist unless they exist in you. There were really three major questions in antiquity which had challenged philosophers, uh, thinkers, and which the church also had to answer uh, those questions. What is truth? What is goodness? And what is beauty? And in uh, the time together that we want to look at uh, Augustine's life, I'm really kind of exploring that Augustine's answer to that question, what is beauty? In the passage that I've just read, which comes in book 10 of his Confessions, he answers that question in a very, very short frame. Ultimately, God is beauty. And the reason why there is anything that is beautiful in this world, the reason why we have a hunger for what is beautiful, is because of the, the fact that God has made this world. He's made us. He's made us for himself. He's given us a hunger for ultimate beauty, which ultimately can only be found in him. Augustine uh, admits that he didn't always see the answer that way. He was immersed, he says, in the beautiful things of this world, looking for peace and meaning in those things and not ultimately in their creator. Now, the facts of Augustine's life are pretty well uh, known because he lays them out for us in the Confessions. In fact, we know more about Augustine than any other ancient figure uh, after the New Testament period. In fact, we know the exact date of Augustine's birth, November the 13th, 354, which is a very, quite rare in, uh, for figures of the ancient world. He was born in North Africa, uh, born in what is now Algeria, at a place in, in the Roman terminology called Tagaste, T-H-A-G-A-S-T-E. Uh, today, it's the town of Sukaras, and it's about 150 miles from the Mediterranean. Um, he grew up in a mixed household. His mother, Monica, was a believer, but had probably entered into an arranged marriage with an unbeliever named Patricius, or Patrick, 
as we would uh, call the name of his father to do. His father was ambitious um, for himself and then for his son. Um, he was a civil servant, but uh, felt that North Africa gave little scope to his uh, desires and little scope to his ambitions. He never got out of North Africa, his son would. And uh, some of that ambition was transferred into his son's uh, psyche uh, growing up. His mother, a believer, prayed earnestly for both her husband's salvation, he would come to faith in Christ on his deathbed, and then her son's salvation, which was in her mind seemingly prevented for 32 years. And obviously she would have great joy seeing her son come to faith in Christ uh, in 386. She would die two years later in 388. We know of a brother named Navigius. We know of a sister. Uh, we don't know if there are any other children. We don't even know the birth order. Uh, probably Augustine is the eldest. His early education was in Tagast, and then he was able, by uh, virtue of a patron named Romanianus, uh, to go to the great city of Carthage. It might well have been the first time that Augustine saw the Mediterranean. Carthage was about 150 miles away from Tagast. When he went there, his mother warned him of two things, two sins he should never commit. Fornication and the sin of adultery. But Augustine, at the age of 17, when he goes to Carthage in 371, has quite different passions in play. As he says, I went to Carthage where I found myself in the midst of a hissing cauldron of lust. I had not yet fallen in love, but I was in love with the idea of it. And although my real need was for you, my God, who are the food of the soul, I was not aware of this hunger to love and have my love returned was my heart's desire. And it would be all the sweeter if I could also enjoy the body of the one who loved me. And like far too many students then and down through the centuries and now, uh, Augustine's first year at university was one of uh, visiting the body theater, uh, engaged uh, at times in sexual encounters, seeking for love, using sex for that search. But within two years, by 373, everything had changed. He had read a book written by a man named Cicero, the a great Roman orator uh, from a, an earlier era, in which Cicero recommended that young men uh, search for wisdom. Augustine would, would later put it this way as to how the book impacted him. It altered my outlook on life. It changed my prayers, O oh Lord, and provided me with new hopes and aspirations. All my empty dreams, his hunger for, for love and his lust, suddenly, suddenly lost their charm, and my heart began with a throb of bewildering passion for the wisdom of eternal truth. My God, how I burned with longings to have wings to carry me back to you, away from all earthly things, though I had no, no idea what you would do with me. In Greek, the word philosophy means love of wisdom, and it was with this love that Cicero's book inflamed me. But also, he had taken a wife, a common law wife. The arrangement was typical of Roman males of middle and upper class, that in their late teens, as they were pursuing education, they would take a woman into their household of a lower class. And... Uh, crudely and essentially use her for sex. And then at a later point, maybe in their mid-twenties, when they were established as in their career, they would kick her out and have a formal marriage to someone of their social class. And so the, the term concubine or mistress is probably an appropriate term initially, but the relationship becomes much, much more than that, as we shall see. And uh, that's why the term common law wife is probably a better term to describe this relationship that Augustine now enters into. He never tells us the name of the woman. It has been speculated, although this cannot be proven, it has been speculated that maybe the woman became a believer after Augustine, as we will see, she's wrenched out of Augustine's home. Um, maybe she became a believer and Augustine does not want to embarrass her. She goes back to North Africa. And it's quite possible that she was in communities that would have been known to Augustine and would have known Augustine 
and maybe that is a, a correct speculation, but we don't know. But Augustine does not name her. By the age of 28 in the year 383, Augustine now had reached the apex of his ambitions. He had graduated with what we would describe today as a PhD in the subject of rhetoric. Rhetoric was the most important subject taught in Roman schooling. It was the ability for politicians and generals and those who dealt in public affairs to be able to speak in public. It trained them to know how to use their voice, how to use illustrations, how to make an argument, how to persuade, how to impact affections. And it was a very, very important subject because the sons of Roman governors and those who are budding politicians, etc., would have to take this subject. And Augustine then would be exposed to some of the elite figures of the Roman Empire. But he's teaching in Carthage and he's deeply frustrated by that. And so in 383, at the age of 28, he abandons Carthage and uh, moves to the city of Rome. Uh, he leaves his mother in Carthage. She had never crossed the Mediterranean and uh, probably had never been outside of uh, North Africa. Uh, at a certain point after her death of her husband in 372, she had joined uh, the household of Augustine with his common law wife, a son they had named Adiodatus, which is an interesting name because it means gift from God. And then one or two of Augustine's friends whom he appears to have supported uh, financially. The entire household, except for his mother, moves to Rome. Augustine is hoping that when he gets to Rome, that he'll have much better students. Um, it'll give him scope for his even greater ambitions. But August, uh, but the time in Rome is a bit of a disaster. One of his close friends who had moved with him from North Africa dies. Augustine nearly dies of a disease. Uh, his students don't pay their fees. And the city during the summer months is absolutely sweltering. A million people squashed into a space that today in terms of um, per capita population and size would be much more denser in population than either say Mexico City or Calcutta. And uh, in 386, 385, 386, Augustine uh, hears of a position in Milan. And so he moves north, uh, a university position. Milan was much closer to the center of power. Rome was more of a, an iconic town now. It was not the center of Roman governance. And Augustine then moves north uh, to Milan uh, to take up this university position about a year after he had arrived in Rome. Uh, his mother will track him down. And uh, how she uh, found him is not known, but somewhere in the course of early 385, she appears on the scene. And so his mother then rejoins his household in uh, 385. The other significant uh, uh, item that happens as Sir Augustine moves to Milan, not only is he sec uh, uh, secured a fabulous position teaching rhetoric, to the sons of Roman politicians and governors among the elite figures of the Roman Empire and therefore earning a very large salary. Uh, a salary large enough that he could rent a house with a garden. This is very, very unusual in this uh, period to, for anybody to have a garden. I mean, today it's just par for the course when you buy a home that there would be some sort of uh, grassy um, uh, lawn or something in the backyard or in the front yard, but in the period we're looking at, maybe only 2% of people in the Roman Empire uh, could afford a home or rent a home with a garden. And so it gives you some indication of the sort of salary that Augustine is securing. The other significant thing though in Milan is that Augustine came across a Christian preacher by the name of Ambrose. Ambrose was well, very well known in uh, the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, as a gospel preacher. Um, he uh, was the bishop of the leading church in Milan and a very, very eloquent speaker. He too, like Augustine, had been trained in rhetoric. His father was a provincial governor and there were hopes that he would succeed as a governor, uh, but he was uh, converted before that took place and became ultimately the bishop of the church, the leading church 
in Milan. And so Augustine, hearing of his uh, of his great ability as a speaker, uh, starts to go back to church. He had given up on Christianity many years earlier in North Africa, as he was raised in his mother's home. Um, he had come to view his uh, mother's faith as something that was reserved for women. Um, he was a bit of a misogynist in his early years that this would change. Uh, and then uh, something maybe for slaves, but not for men who thought. He had a very good idea of his own gifts and his own genius. And uh, it was not until he met Ambrose that he met somebody whose intellect matched his own. And so he started to go back to church. Um, what attracted him was not the content of Ambrose's message, but the, the, uh, the ability and skill with which he presented that message. But it was neither that nor the content that initially drew him to Ambrose. It was Ambrose's kindness, as uh, uh, Augustine uh, would say. I was all ears to seize upon his eloquence. And as I did so, it was his kindness that drew me. I began to sense the truth of what he said, but only gradually. I thrilled with love and dread alike. I realized that I was far away from you, and far off I heard your voice saying, I am the God who is. This experience of, of uh, Augustine recognizing the truth of, of uh, Ambrose's preaching uh, was not his conversion. Um, he is now being awakened to realize that his philosophical ideas are bankrupt and that he really needs to know uh, Christ. Uh, as uh, Augustine is going back to church, his mother is behind the scenes now um, and uh, actually sins. She appears to have uh, uh, acceded to the kind of custom of Roman males taking a woman as their concubine or as their a common law wife, and she begins to arrange a marriage uh, for Augustine. And uh, the relationship with this uh, concubine had to go. And uh, uh, she is wrenched from Augustine's household. Augustine puts it this way later in his confessions. The woman with whom I'd been living was torn from my side as an obstacle to my marriage. And this was a blow which crushed my heart to bleeding because I loved her dearly. She went back to Africa, vowing never to give herself to any other man. But I was too unhappy, too weak to imitate this example set me by a woman. I took another mistress without the sanction of wedlock. Up until this point, Augustine would, if you had spoken to Augustine and asked him, what's your real problem with Christianity? Um, initially, he would have said something along the lines of, uh, Christianity is really not for thinking men. He had intellectual questions, which he felt Christianity didn't answer. Uh, intellectual questions regarding things like the origin of evil. Where did evil come from? Why is it not explained where evil came from in the book of Genesis? But as a passage like this real, made Augustine realize, the, the uh, woman whom he had loved being wrenched from his home by his mother, gives you some idea of how influential his mother was in his life, forced Augustine, and then his taking another a woman as a mistress, forced Augustine to realize that the real problem in Augustine's life was not intellectual. It was the bondage of his affections. And I dare say that this is paradigmatic for probably many uh, who come to faith in Christ, that the real issue is never primarily intellectual. The real issue is the aversion they have for God and the delight that they have in sin and the desire to stay uh, uh, in those sinful pursuits and sinful habits. And this is what needs to be broken in Augustine's life. He needs an, a new affection a new set of affections, a love for God that is deeper than intellectual, that encompasses both heart and will. So this is the immediate background to Augustine's conversion in the uh, summer of 386. Having come to Italy, seeking to realize his goal of great ambition, 
realizing it in part, eventually in Milan. Um, his mother appearing, uh, forcing his common law wife out of his home. What she should have done was arrange for their uh, formal marriage, but she doesn't. And then Augustine taking another mistress because what he's really in bondage to is sexual pleasure. In the summer of 386, in August of 386, one of Augustine's friends, a fellow North African named Ponticianus, came to visit Augustine. Uh, it was about some business dealing with uh, his, his uh, role as a professor and uh, some political issues. And as they're chatting, Ponticianus happens to see on a table in the room where they are a book. He picks it up. It's Augustine, it's a, a Paul's letters, the letters of the Apostle Paul. Um, that uh, had been collected as an independent volume. Ponticianus expresses his surprise to find the book there. Um, Augustine tells him, yes, I'm reading scripture. Um, whether or not Ponticianus knew that Augustine was going back to church, we don't know. And as uh, when Augustine has told him that he's reading the scripture, Ponticianus begins to tell him the story of a number of men who had given up everything to follow Christ, one in particular, who his name is Antony of Egypt. And as Augustine is hearing this, these stories, he begins to reflect within himself that it had been 12 years or more since he had read Cicero's book on loving wisdom and seeking wisdom. But he was no further ahead. These men who hear the gospel had immediately embraced it. Here was Augustine dallying, as it were, on his search for wisdom that had taken now a dozen years, but he was no further ahead. And he, as Ponticianus is telling his story, eventually concludes and eventually leaves, Augustine is under deep conviction of sin. He goes out into the garden and describes what happened there. There was a small garden attached to the house where we lodged. I now found myself driven by the tumult in my breast to take refuge in that garden where no one could interrupt that fierce struggle in which I, I was my own contestant. I was besides myself with madness that would bring me sanity. I was dying a death that would bring me life. I was frantic, overcome by violent anger with myself for not accepting your will, O God, and entering into your covenant. I tore my hair hammered my forehead with my fists. I locked my fingers and hugged my knees. I was held back by mere trifles. They plucked at my garment of flesh and whispered, are you going to dismiss us from this moment? We shall never be with you again forever and ever. And obviously he's thinking here of the sexual pleasure that he had with his mistress. I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes. In my misery, I kept crying. How long shall I go on saying tomorrow, tomorrow, I will come to you? Why not now? Why not make an end of my ugly sins at this very moment? And so this, this inner struggle, which Augustine captures so eloquently, that happens for many as they come to faith in Christ. The realization that God demands the entirety of a person's being, not just simply their intellect, but their intellect, their will and their affections. And as Augustine is wrestling with himself, he hears a voice and he puts it this way. Suddenly I heard the sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. Whether it was the voice of a boy or a girl, I cannot now say, but again and again it repeated the refrain, take it and read, take it and read. The Latin there is two simple words, tole, take it, lege, read. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not Augustine actually heard a voice or whether it was God speaking to Augustine. I tend to uh, to think it was an actual voice. Augustine tried to figure out whether it was a game that children played and this was a refrain, but he couldn't. He then thought maybe it's a command from God to go back into the house and read the scriptures. Take it, the book of Paul, and read the scriptures. He remembered that Antony had gone to church on one occasion and had heard that passage from the uh, Gospels. If you want to be perfect, sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he had gone and done likewise. And so Augustine says, I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up, telling myself this could only be a divine command to open my book of scripture. 
and to read the first passage on which my eyes should fall. So I hurried back into the house, seized the book of Paul's epistles and opened it. And in silence, I read the first sentence that hit my eyes, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries, rather arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. It's the verses from Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. It was a very apropos text. I had no wish to read more, no need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. As Augustine would summarize only a few lines after this long text that I've just read, you, that is God, converted me to yourself. When Augustine came to write the confessions, he would realize that at work in his life, ever since his birth, that actually had been God. God, the great seeker of sinners, drawing him, ever drawing him, pursuing him. As one more recent writer, Francis Thompson, has described, God is the hound of heaven who pursues his people and draws them to himself. And if God had not drawn him, Augustine would never have come. You converted me to yourself. He would later say this about his conversion. I want to read two uh, texts. Uh, the first one, it runs like this. During all those years of my rebellion, where was my free will? Where was the hidden secret place from which it was summoned in a moment so I might bend my neck to your easy yoke? How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure, though not to flesh and blood. You who outshine all light, yet are hidden deeper than any secret in our hearts. You who surpass all honor, though not in the eyes of men who see all honor in themselves. O oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. Augustine then uh, realizes that the ultimate hunger he has has been for God all along. And that the beautiful things in creation are never meant to satiate and satisfy us, but are meant to draw us to the God of all beauty. I began with a passage um, which ran like this. I was late in loving you, O oh beauty, so ancient and so new. I was late in loving you. A passage in which Augustine answers that question of what is beauty and answers it that ultimately beauty is God. We've seen, we've seen how in Augustine's life he has uh, wrestled with that question, uh, seeking primarily in sexuality and sexual expression and sexual intimacy to find the beauty that uh, gnawed at his soul. In so many ways, Augustine in this regard is so like modern men and women. If uh, there is something that our society is absolutely passionate about and gives the impression of is that sex and intimacy, sexual intimacy is the deepest, uh, is the, will satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. Here is a man, Augustine, who had indeed gone that route and found it did not satisfy, but found that there was something deeper that was needed, namely an embrace of the God of beauty in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the passage that was read at the beginning <clears throat> and the, the line of first line of which I read uh, just now, it goes on like this. And he links, uh, Augustine links his uh, conversion with God as a God of beauty. I was late in loving you. Oh, beauty so ancient and so new. I was late in loving you. You called me and shouted and pierced my deafness. You sparkled and shone and dispelled my blindness. You are fragrant and I breathed in and now I gasp for you. I tasted and now I'm hungry and thirsty for me, you. You touched me and now I burn for your peace. In the Latin and even in the English, these are this is a brilliant use of language. Paul, uh, uh, Augustine uses the uh, five senses 
that we have the sense of hearing, the sense of seeing, the sense of smell, the sense of tasting, and the sense of touch, and shows how ultimately they speak to our deepest need of finding fulfillment in knowing the God of beauty who has revealed himself in that most beautiful beings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Augustine, a year later, in the uh, spring of 387, was baptized. If you ever go to Milan, you can actually go to the cathedral in Milan. And if you go into the basement, you will actually find in the basement uh, the baptismal pool in which Augustine was baptized. Uh, the dominant mode of baptism in the ancient world uh, for believers up until the time of Augustine, up until the early 5th century, was immersion and uh, immersion of believers. And it was there in at Easter of 387 that Augustine was baptized, immersed as a believer by Ambrose. Did Ambrose know the significance of what was going on there? Not simply the significance of the act of baptism, but the way in which that baptism would change the entire course of the Western history. As I said right at the beginning, Augustine is one of the great figures, not simply of the church, but of Western history in general, and nothing would be the same ever again. Augustine uh, uh, and his mother and their household would make eventually their way back uh, to uh, North Africa in 388. His mother would die at the port of Ostia, the port of the city of Rome. Rome is uh, a couple of miles up the Tiber River and used two ports, Portus and the city of Ostia, uh, which still exists as their ports. And it would be there that his mother would die and be buried there. And Augustine would make his way back to North Africa, where he became a leading bishop um, and a well-known preacher and uh, becomes the bishop of a town called Hippo Regius. Really what we would describe today more as the senior pastor of uh, that town and uh, would minister there from 395 to 328 when he would step into retirement. Um, sorry, 395 to 428. Uh, when he would step into retirement and then would die in 430 when the town was being besieged by a barbarian group known as the Vandals. And that would be another lecture uh, to talk about uh, the collapse of the Roman Empire and Augustine's great vision of history and the way in which he enabled God's people to rise above that cataclysmic uh, event. But what of you? Uh, you may have listened to this and not be in Christ and be far from Christ like Augustine was, seeking for beauty in the things that are beautiful. But do you know the God of beauty who has revealed himself in the Lord Jesus? Uh, may uh, this time in reflecting upon this be, be an encouragement for you as you uh, seek uh, what is true beauty, namely, namely God. Well, I'm uh, happy to take some questions. Uh, and uh, if uh, there are questions there, they can be, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, rest, we'll, we'll go through those. And then uh, I'll have after the questions a, a concluding word. Augustine's life is uh, just a tremendous one. Uh, as I said, there's a lot more that could be said about his life. And um, uh, uh, the, uh, the relevance, I think, to our day is very, very uh, apropos. Uh, one of the books I always recommend that uh, students read um, uh, from the early church or the ancient church is Augustine's Confessions. There'll be things in there that you'll disagree with, but the overall message is so, so encouraging. And um, that's how we know so much detail about Augustine's early life is uh, through this particular book. Um, as I've said, uh, there's a lot more that uh, one could say about Augustine. I do teach a course on Augustine at Heritage, and it uh, might be something that uh, you may want to take in at some point, um, and where we not only look at um, the kind of life of Augustine, but also consider his thought. Um, his thought is particularly important. The Confessions is one of his great books. Uh, the City of God, which I alluded to at the end there, uh, in which he deals with the fall of the Roman Empire and has a fabulous vision of history. And then his um, uh, third book, um, which is important, uh, is uh, his book on the uh, Trinity. 
So it appears we do have a couple of questions, so I'm I'm happy to take those and uh, then we'll have a, a concluding word. On the topic of goodness, uh, what James from Augustine uh, tells us of his thought on uh, God's goodness. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mentioned at the beginning uh, there were um, uh, three uh, questions and uh, three questions the ancient world wrestled with. What is truth? What is goodness? What is beauty? Um, Augustine does deal with a number of answers to both of those other two questions. Uh, what is goodness? Um, he has a book on the good life, uh, what it means to lead a good life, what it means to be a good person. And uh, that would be a, uh, a book that you could look out. Uh, many of his books are online. Um, on the blessed life uh, uh, is also sometimes the uh, the title of that. Uh, what are some uh, bibliographical resources that uh, I would suggest uh, for the life of Augustine? Uh, probably the best one um, is uh, Peter Brown. Um, it's fairly big. Um, and if you really want an exhaustive overview of Augustine's life, um, it's probably the best. Um, Peter Brown wrote that very early in his academic career in the late uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s. He then wrote a revised version, as it were, 25 years later, or at least a version in which he had an extensive afterward in which he had reevaluated his thinking about Augustine. And um, so that's a very large volume. But probably the one that I would recommend that uh, gets you into Augustine fairly easily um, is a book by a man named Gary Wills. Um, Gary Wills has a book, very few footnotes. Um, you could read it in probably three hours. It's a fairly quick read. And um, it gives you a, a very, I think, a very, very helpful um, overview of Augustine's life. Uh, John Piper um, used to have a uh, he used to do a biographical lecture every year at his pastor's conference, and he has a, a very beautiful lecture uh, on Augustine. Um, how could you say, this is a question, how could you say St. Augustine, Augustine's life can speak in today's world? Um, probably on a number of areas. Um, uh, theologically, his doctrine of the Trinity is very, very helpful. He argues uh, uh, very powerfully that the that the heart of who God is, is love. Uh, love of the Father for the Son, and love of the Son for the Father, and that that love actually is the Holy Spirit. And um, so it's really quite a, a remarkable uh, book. Uh, so that's on the Trinity. Um, his Confessions, uh, a study of conversion. Um, and as I hope I've kind of indicated in, in this uh, online lecture, um, something of his um, uh, relevance is found in the fact that he wrestled uh, with things that modern men and women are are still wrestling with. Um, is uh, sexual intimacy the, the apex of the human experience or is there something more? And Augustine's answer unequivocally would be, yes, there is something more. That um, that intimacy which God desired to be a part of marriage is not the be all and the end all of life. That there is something beyond that, and namely the the intimacy that we can have with the God of beauty. Um, and then Augustine's um, uh, City of God is just a tremendous study about how to be a Christian in a culture that is falling apart. And I think I only began to realize the significance of that work after 9-11 and uh, that iconic event that so startled uh, Western culture. A uh, question uh, also on um, Augustine's thinking about the atonement. Um, Augustine would have had a commitment to what we call particular redemption. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, the doctrine that Christ died for his people. Uh, Augustine uh, is very, very committed to that particular perspective. Um, it's part of his larger uh, debate with a group known as the Pelagians who uh, argued that men and women are born in a state of innocence and only sin because of the impact of their culture. Uh, it's not because they are by nature sinners. And Augustine argues for total depravity or original sin and then moves on from there that if it is the case that we are in bondage to sin 
and only God can free us. And then he argues that follows that Christ died only for the elect. Um, needless to say, his, his, his position on that has been controversial uh, down through the years, although there are many uh, uh, in the Augustinian tradition, uh, people thinking here are people like John Calvin, uh, John Owen, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Andrew Fuller, uh, C.H. Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who have followed Augustine in this thinking. Um, how to read the confessions. Um, uh, you probably need to begin at the beginning. Um, in some of book, Augustine's books, like The City of God, uh, you really need a, a reading plan. And I, I have a reading plan. If any of you are interested, uh, you can email me um, at my heritage address, mhaken at heritagecs.edu. But um, <clears throat> um, confessions, you really need to read the whole story. Uh, there are really two sections of the confessions. Books one through nine is the biographical material where Augustine begins with his early life and then leads you all the way through to his baptism in book nine and his beginning to go back uh, to North Africa. And then books 10, 11, 12, and 13 deal with a set of topics that are important for Augustine, uh, memory, time, and the, how to understand Genesis one to three. And so it would be feasible to read um, uh, the confessions, uh, books one through nine and omit the the, the later portions. Um, but you definitely have to read them uh, sequentially uh, to get the full story of Augustine's life. Does Augustine's idea of beauty change from the time of writing his confessions to the time he wrote The City of God? Not, not, not essentially. It does change from his very early books uh, after his conversion. He began writing almost immediately. And um, it's as Augustine comes to understand God as the sovereign God of grace in the 390s, which lies at the heart of his confessions, that his understanding of God as beauty would probably take on certain new elements. But essentially, uh, the answer that Augustine discovers, which is that God is beauty and God is the beautiful, um, essentially doesn't change from the confessions onwards. He writes that in 399, about 30 years uh, before his uh, death. And then how would you encourage believers who have no study, who have no study in church history uh, to pursue it? Um, how would you encourage believers who are new to faith to pursue church history? Um, there are certain books uh, that are very helpful. Uh, there is an older book, Jeremy Jackson, uh, No Other Foundation, um, which is a great one volume study of 2000 years of uh, church history. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson has a little book, uh, Church History 101, which um, has 20 chapters. Each chapter is a century. And that is a very, very helpful uh, way of reading uh, church history. And then a uh, third uh, 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 possibility is that John Piper, that biographical lectures that he gave every year to pastors, has collected those in one volume. And I forget the exact title, but it's a great overview of various biographical studies. And usually biographies are is a great way into studying the history of the church as you read about uh, a fellow believer and uh, their lives. And uh, Augustine's biography, the Gary Wills biography, uh, could be a very, very helpful way in getting somebody into church history. Uh, the book that I use in Church History 1, Church History 2, is edited by Timothy Dowley, uh, D-O-W-L-E-Y, an introduction uh, to the history of Christianity. And uh, it's another it's more academic, but it's another excellent entry point into the history of, of the church. Uh, church history is very, very important. And uh, we need to know as God's people uh, where we've come from. And uh, it is sadly ignored by far too many in the contemporary church. And I think in that mirrors a larger culture that really is not interested in history as a vehicle of wisdom maybe for entertainment for two or three hours to watch a historical drama or a historical movie, but as a source of wisdom, no. And uh, our failure as Christians to um, engage church history and to think about uh, those who've gone before us and what we owe them um, is really kind of an imitation of our larger uh, culture. 
Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening in uh, to this lecture on Augustine. As I said, there is much, much more that could be uh, known about him, and maybe you'd want to do that in um, one of our courses uh, that we teach at, uh, at Heritage. I do teach a course on Augustine, uh, usually every second or third year um, in the fall and um, or in the in the in the winter uh, months and that might be something you want to consider or you might want to consider taking a course at heritage uh, to deepen not only your knowledge of church history but also scripture and let me encourage you uh, to to do that to do so uh, next uh, week will be i believe the conclusion of this series of online lectures and uh, dr rick reed is going to speak about preaching and i would encourage you as you have uh, uh, tuned into this lecture that you would also uh, tune into that. And may the Lord, uh, the God of beauty, keep you and bless you and lift his countenance upon you and give you what Augustine hungered for and what we all hunger for, namely peace. Amen. <laughs>